or like an ad game. Tell me if that works. I'll see you now. Maybe that didn't work. Alright. I'm hoping this is connected now. Let's see now. Well, it's taking some time. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. As soon as you don't think it's a way, it's a way. As soon as it, as soon as you you think that you've seen the last of it, no, it's right there for you. Yes, as soon as you get discouraged, the motivation is right there for you in your face. Staring at you. All right, right you ready? Bushy tail. Already. So obviously you don't want to. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is kind of going a little bit. So uh, welcome everybody. We're, we're doing book talk, uh, talking about blunt force trauma, uh, the book by the gentleman here I have with me, uh, Soul Speaker. Uh, if you would like to share a little bit about you and and uh, before we get started, let's let's uh, let's do that. All right. Uh, thank you for the introduction uh, again, uh, Agent Edwards. I appreciate your willingness, your preparation, your patience with me when it comes to um, bringing this content to the people um, nightly, like we have. I know we've had technical issues. I know we've had traffic. We've had every obstacle you can imagine. We've had uh, bladders that need to be emptied uh, from our four-legged friends. Uh, and so I um, appreciate your ability and willingness to be here and, and help um, again um, with this content, with this book, with this mission. Uh, this mission took a large step today. I, I said that we'd be updating the people about uh, the Butterfly Sanctuary. Uh, and today I'd like to announced that with your contributions, with your help, with your motivation, with your sharing of the story uh, of blunt force trauma, uh, we were able to uh, 
officially file for our nonprofit status, uh, and then also uh, build out the LLC, which is the building you, which again, brings you this book. And so um, to be able to take those steps uh, to not only secure um, this passion, but to, to submit uh, this legacy, uh, right? And to take steps with that is to me um, huge. It's important, it's what um, this has led to. And so I'm happy to be at this bridge and, and crossing this bridge and, and we'll keep going and I'll keep updating folks um, as to how we're gonna continue to build an international place uh, for trauma healing. Absolutely. So let's jump in. Uh, where we picked uh, for today, <clears throat> we picked uh, Snatched to be our uh, our content to cover. So I'm going to read it, and then we'll jump right in. Snatched, snatched overnight. He was gone. Judge getting kickbacks, but my brother is wrong. Sure enough. A crime was committed, but restoration was needed. The victim spirit defeated. The state stepped in, incarcerated my brother, throw them all in jail, one after another. You need to read Maya to know why the cage bird sings. There are humans locked in cages disconnected and abused amongst other things. He made it home at 18, changed forever, <clears throat> institutionalized, but finally together. Deep. So uh, please share with us what inspired you uh, to, to write this piece, this amazing piece. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you for reading. Um, this piece was inspired by my brother's incarceration. He was locked away for uh, 18 months. Uh, and trying to really capture that moment, um, I wanna say um, starting the day that he uh, ran away, he uh, asked me to, or asked me uh, when I woke up one morning uh, with this really serious face, uh, he said, give me your keys, I need your keys. And um, being the big brother I was, I was like, okay. You know, I gave him my keys, uh, he disappeared. And so <laughs> when my mother and father asked, you know, where um, where my brother was, I, I told him, I, I don't know. I didn't ask him where he was going. They were um, upset with me, uh, to say the least. Um, my father was um, justifiably enraged and, um, but later on understood why I did what I did. He didn't hold me at fault later on when he thought about it, he understood that uh, had he been asked the same question by his brother, he might've done the same thing. And so um, uh, that started this process. And, and you know, a month later, two months later, my brother's turned himself in, um, the judge is sentencing him for um, 18 months. Uh, and, and so to have a piece of our family, a, a, a fixture of our family in the youngest uh, child was, um, it's hard to explain to see your, your parents break down, um, to be grief stricken, you know, stop eating, you know, stay in the room for long periods of time. It, at, at my age was, I didn't know what to do with that. Um, um, try to hold space and talk with them when I could, um, as well as dealing with my own trauma from that experience, having him ripped away. Uh, it felt like he was snatched in the middle of the night because he was you know, here one minute and then gone. Uh, so, so to see uh, that experience was uh, inspired this piece. Absolutely, I, I can feel Live it. that experience. Yeah. So uh, do you think your brother should have gotten a different result from the one he got uh, that he ended up getting? Um, I don't know. It's a hard question because I, I don't think that it's important. Um, 
because I, I say that because I talk about how the judge was getting kickbacks. You know what I mean? There was an incentive to have my brother incarcerated. Um, people made money off of his incarceration. So should he have had to have a um, mandated um, response to his crimes? Yes. Um, and that's what I, I talk about when I say restoration. Um, but, you know, that's, that's here nor there. That, that happened and that's, that's what it was. And so it's hard for me to get into the shit of wood. I, 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 rem I can see my mother's face when my brother got those handcuffs put on when he's taken away in court. Um, you know, it's easy for me to go back and, and relive that experience. And it's just, it's traumatic. Um, even now to be in it. So I don't, you know. So, okay. So that aside, uh, what do you think moving forward would be a better alternative for somebody in a similar situation like that? who has that support system like your brother had with your family, uh, what do you think would be a better uh, option for them uh, other than getting incarcerated? Well, I think that we need systems of restoration. I think that we need to uh, teach people and help people understand, you know, what's accepted and what's not accepted. I, I think uh, in incarceration, especially in the way that we do it with a for-profit system, is only going to um, feed the system our bodies. And so if we don't come up with a system that can meet crime or injustice or punishment with some other form of intervention, we're gonna continue to have the problem that we're having. Um, and I think that's what I'm committed to is that problem not being that problem, right? Um, where we're losing uh, black folks in, in fourth grade. Right, third grade reading scores create prison beds. That is what needs to be broken. That is what needs to be committed to as far as um, ending. Um, you know what I mean? Like that's that's the angle I would prefer to to, to come at that versus um, how are we going to stop criminals? Well, we have systems that influence crime. You know what I mean? Like let's. Let's let's end food deserts, right? Let's make fresh fruits and vegetables available to everybody. Let's, uh, especially poor people, right? Let's reinvest in communities where we raped and privileged um, and destroyed and firebombed, right? Like you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I kind of get a, a, a I kind of understand what you're saying. Uh, to you know to give back to those uh, marginalized communities more. So uh, how was it when your brother returned back to home after after being incarcerated for 18 months? Well, I don't want to move on if you kind of understand. You know what I mean? Like, let's, we don't have to be in a rush. Like, if you, if you kind of understand where, where am I missing you? So uh, you're saying we should pour into the communities that need it most, right? Um, I, I think that um, I touch on that as far as to say that um, an accounting needs to be done if, if we have a community that through um, through laws um, disadvantaged people and made certain advantages for other people, then it, there's an accounting that can be done. I, I think it's practical. I think that it's um, beneficial. Um, we can argue about whether or not it's possible. Um, but I don't think that it's unfair to say that it's clear that it's, it should be done. Um, we can directly make an account for Black Wall Streets across the country. Um, people that were law abiding and filed for business uh, ownership and for profits and made uh, tax claims. We can certainly excuse me, take an accounting of that uh, and be willing to redistribute wealth in a way that accounts for uh, the fact that they were stolen from. Uh, and so I think that's what um, 
that I was referring to as far as um, there are some things that we can do. So just to be clear, you're saying that uh, these communities that were affected by the uh, the burning down of the, the uh, structures that they had with the, the Black Wall Streets, uh, those communities should be reimbursed in some type of way. Not in some type of way, economically, um, that we, um, just like I said, take an accounting of what was lost, whether it be um, building or a car or other material things um, being ran off their land. So the accounting for their, the property, their property value, their homes, their businesses, you know, anything that was lost because they were uh, discriminated against. Got you. So specifically speaking, what you're saying, like an assortment of things, buildings, cars, uh, what would benefit these communities most? Are you meaning uh, the, the economical that you mean? Do you mean like structured businesses or or uh, organizations that will help them uh, with the trauma that they've, they've been through? A combination of both or? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I definitely think based on their accounts that the experience was traumatic. Um, I don't think there can be an accounting for that. I don't think that I think once we start to get into pain and the trauma, then whose pain is worth how much? I mean, what, what I'm talking about is like really taking an accounting of the value of the property, um, given the example of business, home, car that was lost that can be reinvested. Um, I think we talk about Henrietta Lacks cells and the fact that her family is still poor and yet uh, medical science isn't what it is without her cells. That there is an accounting to be made for the contributions of black people and how um, things were taken, that property was taken, that things that had value and fair market value um, can be reimbursed, can be um, to make sure that they're taken care of. They were stolen from. So these part of these rights being written is to reinfuse them with the with the wealth that they had. So when you say wealth, you're not just referring to money. I'm only referring to money. I okay. think money is the only thing that we can take an account of. And so that's when I mentioned buildings and cars and homes, other things that has a monetary value that was lost because of a white mob ran you out of town or whatever. In whatever way that it gets documented that you were cheated and that you were disenfranchised based on your skin color. Those things can be made a reckoning to. Um, those victimizations, those um, acts of enslaved enslavement, is uh, can be rectified for. Understood. So, do you think that that how would that benefit these communities, though? If you have, if you dump money into uh, marginalized communities and they're not educated on what to do with the money, uh, there's countless stories about people who win the lottery, for example, uh, between seven to 10 years later, they're already broke again. So wouldn't it make sense to invest more into institutions in these communities that will empower them with some type of knowledge, skill set uh, for them to build themselves as opposed to just giving them uh, because they'll need again, if they, if, they're, if they need now and then you give them, and then they end up squandering it all, they're gonna need again. So how do we help make them self-sufficient? Well, I think the first thing I would say is that we're not giving them. I don't think we can have the mindset that, that we're giving anything that isn't owed. And so if I work a job and quit and every month they were taking out some of my money to pay me over the summer, when I quit, I'm owed my money. They're not giving me my money. 
they took it out every month to give to me at a certain time. When it came that time, I'm due. Regardless of what I have to do with it, regardless of what the plan, what it is, you know what I mean? Like that's, I think ideally, anytime somebody comes into a lot of money, whether we talk about the draft lottery or reparations, you want to make sure that there's some education around what it is you're going to do with that money. Because like you said, you'll, you'll get recidivism. You'll get people in the welfare line two years later after being millionaires. And you don't want that. That's not good for a social structure. That's not good for community. It's not, it's not good. But at the same sense, um, we have to develop that. This, this podcast is that, right? The gift of game is that. When we talk about financial literacy uh, and, it, and we look like us, that, that's one more comfort point. That's one more comfort land. And being able to get into Facebook and, and do it through different mediums. And really have these level of, of conversations in in your pocket. Um, you know, each one teach one. I think as mentors, as leaders in the community, um, that's that's where we come in. Um, help bridge that gap. Absolutely. So I'm more clear on that now. So we can move on. Uh, so in the uh, conversation, back onto your brother. Uh, when he returned after doing those 18 months, uh, had anything changed about his demeanor, his attitude? Absolutely. Um, I would say that my brother was institutionalized. And I know that was one of the uh, words or um, experiences that we talked to heavy in the first episode. Um, this, this idea about having your mind incarcerated, right? So your, your behavior is incarcerated. Your expectations are incarcerated. You're living to die is a phrase that you used, um, speaking from episode one. Th this, this notion of being mentally locked up is a real thing. I saw my brother go from the life of the party to in the corner in the party to not going to the party. And it was um, a scary experience to re-meet him, to relearn how he is functioning now. Uh, to accept the new limitations of the relationship, to um, give him the space that he was asking for. Um, we were very affectionate, very close knit family. Uh, and so for him to be back and um, not have that same energy was different. It was, it was challenging. It was, um, hard for him to reconnect, yeah. hard for us to reconnect as a family unit. Um, yeah, it was, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. I can't really uh, ask you to speak from his standpoint because only he can speak on this actually. Mm -hmm. But you know, the personally for me, uh, because I did do time before, so mm -hmm. coming out, it was difficult for me as well to make that transition from being, you know, locked up and told what you can and can't do on a daily basis, when you can eat, uh, when you can basically get up and go and use the bathroom, because they had count times where if you're not in your specific area, uh, you you get put in a hole, which is mm -hmm. like a, a small box a smaller box than what you're already in. So to go from that to be basically free is it's a it's a transition that some people take a little longer to make. Mm -hmm. So overall, how do we encourage men to speak up about their inner pains and struggles? You know, similar to like what I'm sure your brother went through a lot of trauma when he was in and he's holding it in instead of, you know, releasing that and uh, beginning the healing process so that he can get back to being that uh, brother that you had before going in and uh, being more open and affectionate like he was before. Uh, so I can, I can speak to what, what I did, what uh, I encouraged my family to do to encourage him to, um, to open up to, to kind of, um, express his emotions. Um, 
we were, uh, like I said, we were very loving and affectionate before. So uh, what we would do is try to invite him back into those similar situations. So uh, we gather around the kitchen during dinner time. Uh, we make big meals. Uh, we play um, card games, dominoes at the table um, for hours. So really um, made the environment uh, similar to what he uh, experienced, or the same really as what he experienced on the way um, but before he was incarcerated. And so uh, inviting him back in, uh, pulling him back in, allowing him to um, to have space as needed, but really like keeping keeping an eye on him, um, making sure that he was connected um, with us, that he wasn't um, he wasn't left, he wasn't forgotten. He might have been gone, but he wasn't forgotten. Um, and so um, that I think helped him to reconnect with us, to relearn how to put his guard down, to let his nerves relax, uh, to to um, it seemingly um, allowed him to kind of ease back in, like you said, to the to the life of being different than having a mandatory dinner time and uh, being institutionalized. Like I said, I don't want to speak too much about how he felt, but I know how it felt to have him. Um, like the first day he he came back home, he isolated instantly. Like it was it was not even a. There was no warm up period. Like he really valued his space, uh, and so having to adjust to that, uh, and and having to develop a plan with my family on how to pull him out of that desire or that learned um, behavior of isolating was um, it was tough. That was, you know. That was difficult for us. I'm sure. So how long has he been out now? Oh, that was 10 years now, a decade. All right. And so I'm I'm sure he's uh made it back to the person pretty much that he was. Man. Um, well, you know what? I will have him as a contributor on on the program and we'll ask him that question because I don't I don't want to. I don't want to speak for him and where he is in his process. Um, and I and I bet I might say something that I see that may be a little different than what he sees. So that might be an interesting conversation. Maybe that's something we could plan for the the two week uh, LinkedIn discussion. Out is that um, we have a discussion about snatched um, with the author and his brother and what it felt like for. And to be in a family and lose a child to incarceration, and for that child to come out and say how, what it felt like to be separated from him, from his family. Yeah, that would be a, a good conversation. And it kind of puts me into the mind of what I put my family through as well, because I was, I'm the youngest child of my mom's. And uh, for, for me to be ripped away from my family three times, I can only mm -hmm. imagine, you know, the pain that I put. Not only her, but my sister as well. My sister was pretty much like my mother uh, because she had more of a hand in raising me because my mother always had to work. So I was ripped away from both of them, you know, pretty much overnight as well. So that's a real thing. It's real traumatic. And, you know, my heart goes out to you and your family for going through that. But, you know, it's good that y'all had that strong knit, you know, for him to have. You know, my family, my I only I grew up in a single family household. So, you know, I didn't have that strong male figure in my family, mm -hmm. but I did have two uh very strong women. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that I did well for myself given what I had as well. So uh I'd agree. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I think I did good. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to, but I think yeah. I did good. I think yeah, I yeah, I did all right. I did all right. <laughs> it could have turned I'm out glad we speak of affirmations. <laughs> no, that's yeah. we speak of affirmations on the podcast. That's all I love. Absolutely. 
So uh, I want to talk about a few lines in the in the uh, the piece, if you don't mind. Uh, you referred to Maya, uh, the cage bird scenes. Uh, so what's the uh, what's the analogy of that with uh, with uh, snatched? Well, I was it was at a moment in time like when um, I was just graduating from high school, and I remember that being like on a reading list, and I just I remember thinking like. Like, do you need to read why a cage bird sings to know, to imagine why a cage bird would sing? You, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's like an acknowledgement of the dual worlds that we live in. You know what I mean? Like, there's a, uh, an existence as a Black American that um, you really have to break down. You really have to talk to people about why a cage bird would sing. Like, why being... Um, disproportionately representing those incarcerated would um, would make you sing, like would make you wish for hope because you don't see hope. You know, I, I said that um, there's research that half the black high schoolers in my uh, years were incarcerated. Like these traps that we jumping over that we trying to escape are huge and I don't even fault folks for falling in them. Like how, it's 50%. I had a one in two chance of being locked up in high in high school. That's that's ridiculous. That's a system. That's a failure. That's exploitation. That's a that's a systematic um you know school to prison pipeline. That's that's what that looks like where half of the high schoolers my age uh, they look like me were um, in jail, so that in prison. So that's to me. That's where I was going with that. Like, you don't need to go to college to understand Maya. You know what I mean? You don't. You don't need to be um, read books and understand the greatest of philosophy and in, in literature to understand why. Um, the the how these institutions touch black bodies, how these institutions destroy black lives and and, and um, destroy black legacies, and so um, we're the, we're the first children that are trying to pick up those pieces emotionally enough to really be able to not only articulate it but but really take you through how that experience not only affects the average but on a grander scheme, like a people, you know what I mean? Like to have 50% of the people that look like you be um, incarcerated, be given records to be, have their lives altered in ways that are irrevertible. Um, it is, it's, it's, it's worse than a pandemic. It's, um, it's the continuation of slavery. It's slavery by another name. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, we, we still in slavery. It's still um, sanctioned by the 13th Amendment. Right. So trying to express what it feels like to survive modern day slavery is, is the objective in that story. And the challenge was that my little brother was snatched into the system and you know you just you never know if you're going to get them back and then you get them back and they're institutionalized and it's like oh, i got my brother for 18 years and when i got him back i had a different form of my brother he was he was different he was changed and he survived and i'm glad and i'm grateful to have him um but he I don't. I don't think I. I got the brother that left. He, you know, he had to change. Yeah, and he had to do what was necessary, you know, to survive, like you said. So, yeah, it's it's a difficult thing. Uh, institutions, unfortunately, they're called departments of correction, but rarely do they correct anything unless you know the person takes it upon themselves, and uh. With that in mind, I'd like to share uh, how uh, 
what Maya said about the caged bird singing, how I interpret it for myself. So uh, being then, I told you about me. Uh, I always kept my mind on being free and uh, my next step on what I need to do as far as mapping out a plan. So I feel like the correlation with that is that when you sing, you have that sense of freedom about yourself uh, that, that makes you see beyond the cage that you're in. So uh, singing kind of helps you escape in a sense. So uh, that's my correlation with that. Uh, being able to, just like you, uh, we when we uh, covered the last piece that you did, uh, dancing, whether it's raining or in pain. So it's pretty much the same thing, you know, just being able to uh, show appreciation, uh, be able to free yourself by, you know, singing, even though you're in a situation where you're locked in and, and can't escape. Yeah, I guess, and um, just to add to that, my, my point of, of putting it in there, I guess I didn't do a good job explaining is that um, yeah, when you when you have this experience, I just think it's funny when you have this experience, that's what's obvious. You know what I mean? We I grew up in Chicago, you grew up in California. Um, I've talked to folks from Texas all over the country. Um, this is that experience. And either you're the person that was incarcerated or you were a family member of somebody who was incarcerated. Um, you know, you lost somebody to some kind of disease, an injury, a, a crime, gunshots. How many of my friends have been shot? Um, so it's that similar experience of loss, like having bodies being snatched out of your life. You know, um, and how the, those people would have impacted you growing up. Right. So, yeah, it, yeah. Uh, whether it be in cages or, or just being taken, like that, the idea of, of of always dealing with that grief, and so singing being one of those things that provide joy, uh, dancing, singing, um, finding a way. Uh, as we talk about healing, we'll be talking about healing in the next Blunt Forward Trauma book healing being so important because you are dealing with so much trauma you really have to have a focus on healing and healing practices uh, and if you don't know how you heal how you get through grief i would urge you to please research find ways in which you um find joy right uh, from within right so when you want to feel joy you can listen to music all right. I like to listen to African music um, that always, no matter what I'm feeling, gets me to dancing, right? Gets me to moving. Uh, and so um, basketball, I, being on the court, it don't matter what's going on in the world. If I'm on the court, I'm focused. Uh, and so, you know, they're the things that make you feel joy. Um, you should know that. And so uh, if you don't, please figure out what gives you joy and brings you joy. Uh, and hold that dear so that when you need to feel it um, and you need to experience it, you can. You can activate that. Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah. So I have uh, no other questions as far as the lines go. Uh, would you like to ask me any questions about the, uh, the this piece, Snatched? Yeah, I mean, I could always ask you, I mean, especially with, about this topic. Uh, I don't want to be rude or invasive. Um, I definitely want you always to feel like you um, don't necessarily have to answer different questions about um, incarceration, uh, but because that is the topic that we're talking about, the subject matter of the uh, of the writing. So um, please let me know if I'm being invasive or you don't want to share. Um, be um, the experiences that my brother shared about. Um, while incarcerated. Um, so I, I'm looking at the lines, um, human beings locked in cages. Since we're talking about the Maya quote, I'd like to go uh, further, um, the next two lines, there are humans locked in cages, disconnected and abused amongst others, amongst other things. To, to, to talk about 
I think that was one of the things that as my brother opened up um, as he was home about the experience he had while he was incarcerated. I think that's what really gave me a lens into why he became institutionalized, why he had to uh, harden in a way to survive just the, the craziness um, from inside. Um, is there, can you share, is there things that you're comfortable with sharing about things that you saw while you were incarcerated that made you think that this isn't a place for human beings? Well, I mean, you know, overall, the the living conditions are, you know, basically uh, as low as you can get. Uh, you're treated in the lowest form. You're not referred to by your name. You're referred to by your prison number. Um, it's just- Can you talk about how that's the meaning in particular, like to not be referred to by your name, but by a number? Well, it's self-explanatory. You're not- uh, you don't feel like you're a human. So you're talked to like less than an animal. Like you're demeaned to the lowest form even. So it's hard so it's not to- not just your number. I guess I was trying to, because I, I don't, I guess I'm not trying to be oversimplified, but when you say that um, it goes without saying, I was meaning like just in particular, um, what things you're called besides that number. And I, I think you added that beautifully as you were speaking that um you're even called outside of your name so you're not so when you're not you're just never called by your name you're a number or you're you're being insulted yeah so it's just you're you're that, am i correct in saying that i'm sorry I, that was a question absolutely yes that's correct you're just basically stripped down to your lowest form and your uh living conditions are lowest form so you're given the lowest forms of food, unless you have uh, somebody supporting you from the outside, sending you money in, and you're able to go to the canteen on a regular basis, you don't really have access to any resources. So you have to rely on the state. And the state is gonna give you the least amount of everything uh, that they can give you because they wanna make the most profit off of you being that head in the bed. At the time, at the time I was doing time, uh, I believe it was $10,000 per head for each uh, bed that they had filled. Uh, so I'm sure that number has gone up quite substantially. And uh, their their aim is to make as much profit off of that $10,000. So they want to spend the least amount of money per month for that $10,000. So they want to keep it around 3000 to 2500 off of 10,000 that they spend on you. So with the food that you get, uh the clothes that you get, it's all penitentiary made clothes where I was at. So they saved a lot of money on that. They just had to pay for the material. Uh the labor that we did, I think the most we could get paid was a dollar 20 uh a day. So that equated to like 24 and some change a month that you made, and that was the most that you can make. Uh, so free labor. So they just maximized in so many different ways on how they were able to make a profit off of you, plus making that $10,000 at the time I was you know, incarcerated. So you were just basically, to sum it all up, you were stripped down to your lowest form. You were subjugated, you were, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, I'm drawing a blank. But basically, they they uh, they used you. Yeah. They used you as much as they could, and in, uh, in every form, and at the same time, just degraded you to the fullest extent. So you know, I understand how your brother. I can't say I understand him his situation specifically because he was in a whole different place than I was in. He's a juvenile. And he was a juvenile as well. I did time in juvenile as well. So he started in juvenile, okay. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I didn't realize you started in uh, juvenile. Well, 
actually I was I experienced trauma before I even came out the womb. Uh it's it's deep, brother. My my mother was beaten uh before I was even born. So trauma for me started even before I came out. So you know, it 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 affected me in so many different ways. Now that I can reflect on it, okay. And, uh, we should you know, definitely take time to reflect. I know that we got 17 minutes here now, but like, and, and please feel free to take that time if you would like to. But let's, I mean, I, I would, I since you that's come out, let's we should make some space for that. Yeah, that's post traumatic. You know, post traumatic syndrome is real. You know. Uh, the emotions that your mother feels when you're in the womb has been clinically proven to affect the the baby inside. So Absolutely. just to know that and to know, you know, in my earlier days of coming up, me and my mother were, I was inseparable from her. I was always under her. And uh, to make that transition from that to, to, uh, to be a young teenager, always angry. Uh, because I didn't have that father who showed any type of interest in me. It was just like an overnight thing now that I think about it. So that was like my compounding uh, transition into the wrong, the wrong direction, you know, because okay. I could have made the, the decision to use that as fuel to go in the right direction. But instead, you know, I, I succumb to my surroundings and, and my ambition to want to have material things like everybody else I saw around me. And, uh, you know, kids go through uh, situations where they have to, they, they, uh, they're judged. And, you know, children can be very brutal with their judgment. Oh, you have on no name brand shoes. Oh, you, you, uh, your hair is nappy. Oh, you, your clothes are wrinkled. You're ashy. Mm -hmm. you know, so to go through those things and to have to fight through it and still stay focused on going in that right direction becomes that much harder. So, you know, it's a painful thing, you know, and uh, I don't mind sharing that because I feel like this can help somebody who may be going through something similar uh, to make them feel like, you know, they're not alone in this situation and that they can relate to somebody in a sense, because I'm able to come out and share this. And hopefully a lot of people see this uh, so that it help that person be able to share it at least with a few people and have that, understanding that it's necessary to release it and not hold it in. Thank you for sharing. I don't quite know where to go. Again, I, I think that um... I think that, you know, just not to cut you off, sorry, but I think that it's good that we're given two perspectives because for me, it's easy for me to understand and realize my side of things. But, you know, for you, you've never been incarcerated, but you have a loved one that did get incarcerated. So just to hear your perspective, your side of things, what you and your family had to go through, it just puts it, it makes me wonder what my family had to go through. And, and I'm going to definitely have this conversation with my mother. I don't want to introduce her back into this trauma that she went through because she's very proud of who I am now. She always tells me that. And uh, I understand that she probably has situations and times where she thought that I wasn't going to make it. And uh, I can only imagine how she felt with me being her youngest born, uh, how that would make her feel. So just to hear this side the other side of the, the story, it really puts it in perspective Excuse for me and it helps me to understand. Absolutely. I... <coughs> oh, I lost you. The phone might die. 
Wow. <clears throat> that's why we do it. I mean, that's to hear him say that that's how he was able to take that and, and hear um, how his mother may have felt, how his family may have felt with him being snatched, with him being the baby um, child and be taken away from his family like that. That's why I shared. That's why um, I wrote this book. So um, I'll give it a minute to see if he's, he's hey, there we go. There we go. There we, go. there we go. I was just telling, was the, people telling the people how, how uh, moving it is for, it me, is for me, to, me to. I'm echoing. I'm echoing. You oh, still echoing? I don't know why. Yeah, you're not, yeah, echoing. You're not echoing. But I'm definitely I'm echoing. Echoing. I can't. I can't. I don't know why. <laughs> I didn't change anything, so I'm not sure why. I know that's annoying, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where did it cut me off? Do you remember? I think, uh, so I'll do the talking since you're echoing. It was, it's good for me to hear your side because that gives, it gives me perspective on what my family may have gone through and, and, uh, the pain that they experienced with the decisions that I made. I see it as, you know, only from my perspective that, you know, I made the mistake I did the time and that's pretty much it. But it's so much deeper than that. You know, there's people who love and care about you and they lose you. And it's like you said, it's in this piece, snatched. It's like you've just been snatched overnight. And uh, the person that they give back has had something taken away from them. So they're not, in a sense, the same person that you remember uh, prior to them going in. So that's a, another form of trauma not to have that whole person back that you remember before them getting incarcerated. So that's just, that gives me, you know, a lot of perspective and I appreciate you, you sharing that with me, you know, just so that I can understand that. That's not, so. That's pretty much it, though. I, I, uh, I enjoyed this piece a lot. You know, this is something that I could really relate with, and and uh, I've, I've been more than happy to share. You know, my perspective. I didn't want to speak too much, but I feel like you know, with me being more versed on the other side, I think that it was good for us to be able to have that perspective that you shared from the family side who, you know, experienced the loss as well as the, I won't say victimized side. You hear me? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it's my feed or, or if it's yeah, your feed. Yeah, your feed is black. But... Okay. Yeah, so just to hear your side and then the side, uh, my side from, you know, the, the standpoint of the person who caught the charge and ended up doing the time. It's just, it's, it's really good to be uh, informed on both sides and, and how impactful it is for both sides. And it's definitely trauma. And that's why, you know, blood force trauma, a black American refugee experience is a definite book that you want to get. It's impactful. It's something that you can, really relate to on so many different levels. Uh, we've only touched on a few different subject lines. There's several others that we're gonna get into as we uh, review the book more. And uh, I just encourage you all to to purchase a copy, to dive into it. It's, it's gonna engulf you. It's gonna, once you start reading the lines, it's gonna pull you in. I read the whole thing in one setting, so. That's how impactful it was for me. And uh, 
I believe that it will be equally as impactful for you if you were to uh, purchase a copy. Purchasing a copy also uh, goes towards a very worthy cause. Uh, the Butterfly san uh, Sanctuary is a place of peace and healing and meditation. Uh, it's something that's really going to be beneficial to so many people. And I think that it's going to start a chain reaction of many other of the similar uh, constructions going up in different places. It's going to really be impactful in uh, helping people heal and get to that better better stage. In a national place of healing. Absolutely. They're, they're going to, so many more people are going to be able to unlock more of their potential because they're going to be able to let out the anger, rage, and any other pent up frustrations they have and have that medium where they can come heal, and heal. begin healing. Absolutely. International Go get your copy of Blood Force Trauma. <laughs> Anything you want to share before we close it up? Not on the echo. On the echo. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Thank you so much, y'all.